Downtown wasn't too bad either, but that place no longer has that space. Cool. Test, test. It's a little hot. Are you streaming on the YouTube channel, David? It is. Oh, that was live. Test. Test, test. That's working. Just about seven, yeah. So how are you doing that? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll try to get people in here in about five or ten minutes. That's fine.
No, but it's okay if you until Saturday. Oh. It's a, the, it's the, the Saturday is the third place game, and Sunday is the final. Last month, we have a now a dedicated microphone. Came up with a new one at work. It's an old crap exception. <laughs> I can think of a thousand things. It's about ten, ten people. So. Yeah, yeah, there were people walking up on the front. Okay, in December. Still, the mid-December was always like fucking. Oh yeah, December. It was always super light. December's already always been bad. Yeah. Right. Well, the weather was bad last month too. November was low. Yeah. Oh, November okay. wasn't great, but November was. Yeah. November is typically bad too. Yeah. yeah holiday yeah. that involves turkey. Yeah, it's going to be a November weather this fall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't ha we don't have weather here, I'm fond of saying.
This plug, and then I should have put this one here. That one there, okay. And then this is the mic, and I'm gonna clip that on myself. Okay. Oh, yeah, and the projector, the projector should be on, so. Okay. Yeah, if you plug it in and it comes over the video feed, we're looking good. The projector is usually slower than these are. Okay, that's my second screen. I need to fix that. No, it just it shows up as a secondary screen in my settings, so I need to fix that. So what I can do is mirror them, and now it should work. Go. All right. Okay. You're looking good. So that's it. The only thing is. You're looking great. Cool. See if I can figure out how to mirror the display. That's what I want to do. Yep, that worked. Cool. second graphics card that gave me a bit of a headache until I figured it out. Um, and, and honestly, it took a whole lot of searching. All right. We're going to get started. Cool. I'm going to pull my paper since all my other devices are taken up. All right. Uh, somebody go nag the people outside. I know that the food's delicious, but... I just nagged them, but somebody should nag them again. Anyway, we'll, we'll just start with announcements, and hopefully they, they come in. Um, I guess we'll start with, with some thanks. Firstly, you're, you're here, right place for San Diego Python. Thank you for coming. Uh, I want to thank um, the Qualcomm Engineering Development Organization, formerly known as the Learning Center. They let us use this space, so that's awesome. Um, we're really thankful for them. We will be here next month as well. Uh, I also want to thank Microsoft. So Microsoft sponsors the food and refreshments outside, which is cool. That's awesome. Um, and I want to thank my co-organizers, Diane and Jeremy. Jeremy's not here. They help wrangle all the speakers, uh, so we have good talks every month. So awesome. A couple other small announcements. Uh, I guess, firstly, I'm David. I'm one of the organizers of San Diego Python. I didn't announce that. Uh, we also have a Saturday meetup. 
It's a little bit different than this meetup. It meets Saturday at 10 a.m. online. Check the meetup.com page, which has all the details. It's still meeting on Zoom and on Discord. Okay, it's meeting on Discord, sorry, but it's virtual. And it's a little bit different than this one. While this meetup is more of like a, you know, we have speakers, we have a speaker lineup, that kind of a thing. That meetup is like online, bring your own project, bring your own laptop, chat with other people who are working on various projects, that kind of a thing. So yeah, it, it's, it's a little different. Some people prefer one, some people go to both. No big deal, but check it out. It's 10 a.m. It'll be on, on the Discord, which I'm gonna dive right into. So we have a website, which I will post in the chat when I get back over there. Um, it's sandiegopython.org, and this has links to our, our code of conduct, has links to the YouTube channel, which is broadcasting this meetup right now. It has links to our Discord, which has a couple hundred people on there who you know are doing Python stuff. There, it's not like you won't be overwhelmed with chat, but you know, yeah, you can chat with other local Python people. So check out those, cons those kinds of things. The website is pretty minimal. It literally is one page, so you won't, you won't be overwhelmed. Um, I wanted to talk about a few upcoming conferences that are coming up, just to sort of shout them out and make sure that people in the community are aware of conferences that happen both uh, in the Python community. Um, Pi Cascades is gonna be in Vancouver, British Columbia in spring. That's kind of like a honorary San Diego conference. Like when I go there, there'll be 10 people from San Diego at that conference. So it, it'll, they haven't finalized the date. I, I don't think they finalized the date. I, I checked two weeks ago, they hadn't, but I, I haven't checked recently. But um, yeah, it'll be in the spring. It's usually actually in the winter, but I think this, this time it's gonna be in the spring. They, they've been virtual, so this will be their first time back. March 18th and 19th. March 18th and 19th, all right, all right. Um, cool. And then Pi Texas is uh, April 1st and 2nd. It's in Austin. And PyCon US, which is gonna be huge, is um, April 19th to 27th in Salt Lake City. Some of that is like tutorials and sprints, so there's a core like three-ish days of conference, so you don't have to go to, what? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So yeah, like if you, if you wanna go to those conferences and you can't afford to go to those conferences, basically there are, there are programs for that, for, for both Pi Cascades and PyCon US. So check them out. I don't even know if Pi Texas costs significant amounts of money. I think it's $50. Yeah, it's 50 bucks. You gotta get to Austin. Yeah, you do have to get to Austin, which is the thing. Um, in, in the Discord, which I mentioned earlier, there's a jobs channel. Um, like if your company's hiring, I would post it in there. If your company is hiring and you wanna give a brief blurb about your company, like you can do that now, but you know, there's 20-ish people here as opposed to like 250 people will read it over time on the Discord. Is anybody's company hiring and they wanna just give a shout out? Tough crowd? All right, no worries. Um, post it in the Discord, that's probably, there's a jobs channel in there. That's probably the best place anyway. Uh, cool. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you're from somewhere other than the greater San Diego area, feel free to post the, where you're visiting us from in the chat. Um, this, this is like, well, I guess a couple last things. I, I'm always looking for speakers at all skill levels. So, you know, don't think I don't know enough Python to be a speaker. These are like, some talks do go long, but you know, these can be a five to seven minute talk. You'll make it, you'll survive. We have a 100% survival rate of speakers. So please, 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 you know, volunteer to give a talk. I'll post the link where you can fill out the, the form uh, about you know, what your talk's about. Do you wanna give it at the next meetup or at a future meetup, all that kind of stuff. I'll post it in the chat when I get back there. Um, but yeah, it, and um, yeah, so please, please, please sign up to be a speaker. I'm the speaker of last resort, like when we don't have enough speakers. And I, I wanna speak as little as possible, so please volunteer all right and we will be back here on the fourth um thursday of january i know that we're meeting here earlier in the month this is the third thursday we usually meet fourth thursday so we'll be back to our regular schedule in january it'll be the the 26th of january and lastly before we get to the speakers i just want to thank um our sponsor jfrog which is a devops platform for continuous releases 
Um, if you need a Pi PI inside your company firewall, they have a product for that. So I, I know that I already did some other thanks for Microsoft for the food and Qualcomm for hosting us and especially to the speakers. But those are all the thanks. And without further ado, I'll, I'll get to Jorge Jimeno, who's going to talk to us about Django functional testing. I'll let you take it away. All right. Oh, and you should put this on. That's the mic. Does it need a face any particular way? No. All right. Let me log in and make sure that everything is showing what it's supposed to be showing. If I can spell my password correctly. I developed software. Cool. All right. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Jimeno. I'm a software test engineer at a company called Insulet. Uh, we help people with diabetes uh, manage their particular complex conditions. That's not the actual tagline of the company, but that's close enough. Um, I'm here on my own accord, so that's about all I'll say where I work, except that I do have the luxury of using Python every day uh, to power automa automated testing. Uh, and I'm super glad for that because some of the alternatives were not quite as much fun. So uh, we do use Django at our company. Uh, I'm not on that particular team, sad face, maybe sometime in the future. But when I was learning Python, um, Django was my, my, my tool for learning. Um, it was a, a library that's been developed. It's in, been in production for well over 20 years. And uh, it, uh, it, is, it was, to me, the gateway of taking Hello World and turning it into solving more complicated problems. For those of you that do web development, you know that a lot of those problems are not simple. Uh, so it was a nice way for me to develop some, some skills of, with Python uh, and put them to work in the real world. So um, what is functional testing? This is not an official definition. There isn't one, but it's one that's kind of commonly accepted throughout the industry. So it's a type of validation that the software that you're working on meets whatever the requirements are. Uh, and typically, those are requirements around how the user interacts with the application. So if I input some data, how does the software respond? What happens when things go wrong? Right? Websites that have a 500, not a great experience. Right, we should fail gracefully, or at the very least, page somebody so that we can take a look and see what's broken. It is very different from unit tests. Unit tests test code. Functional testing tests the user experience, whoever that may be. And then you can use functional testing to, refi to, to, to define requirements. Um, I'm in an industry where I don't get that luxury. We fall under uh, the FDA. And they say that's not good enough. So our process for validation is quite a bit more complicated and convoluted and would probably take up a year of lightning talks uh, for me to even explain what the framework is that we have for establishing requirements. So I'll just say that for Hello World, you can develop some basic functional tests, but very likely you'll need to do a little bit more uh, in the real world. So. Let's take a look at a simple Django project. It literally does Hello World. So I'm not going to split the atom here. And the idea here is just to show a couple of different ways that we could do functional testing with tools that we have available in Python. So given that the user has a browser that has a path to our app, if we go to the home route, we should see Hello World. So if I switch to code, and let me maximize this so that people can read it. Um, that is a template. Yeah, I can expand it and make that bigger. I believe there is a full page view here. Give me a second. How about that? Is that better? Cool. Got lots of thumbs up. I love interaction. So uh, this is a, a very straightforward template, right? We're not splitting the atom here. All I'm doing is I'm showing hello world. And if I go to the, let me turn off that view, and I'll show what the test, test looks like. 
the test lives in a folder called functional tests because I don't want to mix them up with my unit tests. And it's here and I'll maximize that so that again we can, we can see a little bit better. I clicked the wrong thing. All right. So uh, here I, I have some dependencies. I'm using Selenium to power automation. Uh, I'm using uh, a class called Firefox binary, which kind of handles the low level implementation of what powers the Firefox. I, I use Firefox, Firefox as a browser. Um, and I use uh, unit test, which is in the standard library. I'm not a fan of unit tests, and we're gonna fix that later. But for now, it gets the job done. So I'll try to run it, and this probably will not be spectacular in terms of an experience, but we'll do the best we can. So what I'll do here is I'll open a terminal, and then here we will do, and so um, this will fail miserably. That is by design. Um, what we get is this exception here, which is a web driver exception. It says, uh, what web page? There's nothing serving this up, right? So this is, again, part of the not so great experience. I need to actually run the development server so that I can, and I don't have auto completion on, shame on me. Okay, so now the development server is running in the background, and now if I run the test, it will pass. Okay, so one test. And if you don't believe me that this is actually launching a browser, I'd be happy to show you that, that it actually does launch a browser. I just won't make that headless so that you actually see the browser pop up on the display, and it's going to disappear really quickly. So I, what I've done is just I've, I've asserted that Hello World exists on the page. Again, not splitting the atom here. We're keeping the example simple. So what's not great about this experience? Let's go back to our presentation. Um, first of all, it uses unit test. Unit test comes with a standard library, but it has its origins in a package called JUnit. For those of you that are recovering Java developers, you'll know what that is. Um, but it requires that we instantiate a class. It requires that we use an API that has, um, it's not snake case, I believe it's camel case, right? Which is not typical in Python. We have set up and tear down methods. And also we need to run the Django development server separately. That's not awesome if you're doing something like using a continuous integration server like GitHub Actions. Um, you have to include this ugly, piece of code right here, Python manage that, oops, did not want to do that. Python manage that run server and then the ampersand, which means run this process in the background. Not awesome. You can't see the log, just not an amazing experience. So we can do better. So um, the first fix we're gonna do is this running that dev server thing. And how do we do that? Well, Django gives us a nice tool for that. It's called live server test case. And it's in the Django Test tool uh, test module, uh, and it, what it does is that it, it runs your test with the development server on a separate thread. Um, that does have some ramifications if you're using SQLite. You've been warned. Use Postgres. So let's see how this works. And what I'll do is I'll check out iteration one. And Jay, I know you're disappointed, but I'm using PyCharm. Sorry. Uh, we'll force the checkout because I know I made a change there. All right. And let's make this in presentation mode. Just a second here. Um, actually, can you see the code there? Or is that small? It's small? Yeah, let me see what I can do here. Because for some reason, I may be stuck in some mode here. Oh, I know why. Bear with me just a moment, please. We will not edit this out because this is part of the fun of giving talks. Live demos are so dangerous. All right. 
I think we will have to deal with this for now. Okay. Oh, there it goes. All right, enter presentation. All right, that's our new class. So instead of inheriting from unit test test case, we inherit from live server test case, right? We still do the same assertion. We still have the same setup in teardown method. Um, so we'll run this, and this runs a little bit differently. I'll open a terminal. For this, I need to run the uh, Django uh, management command to run tests. And here I need to give it the, a dotted path, which is something that's kind of peculiar with how um, Django does things. It, it, instead of using a path, you give this this dotted thing and it'll run. All right, so the test passed, cool. So what are the learnings that we can take from this? Well, it's a little better. Our CI is gonna be a whole lot happier. We'll actually be able to see log message. We don't get this cryptic exception if we forget to launch the dev server, but we can still do better. Uh, and that's where PyTest comes to the rescue. And if you've never used PyTest, I uh, highly, highly recommend. So we can use functions instead of classes to structure tests. Now, PyTest will still run things if you use unit test test case. It'll still discover those tests and run them. Uh, but you don't have to. Uh, you can use functional tests. Um, it does give us helpers that allow us to use things like live server test cases. There's also helpers for things like transactions if you do transactions to a database. It does require a little bit more setup. So typically you'll have to define a pytest.ini or pass in the path to the settings file on uh, the Django settings file using some command line flag. And if you want to use a fixture, uh, which is an object that you can pass into test cases, you'll need to set up a, a conftest.py file, but we can see what that looks like. So let's check out iteration two. And then we'll look at that full screen. So you'll notice that our test now got a lot shorter, right? Where's all the setup and Daredown stuff? It's not here, That's where that lives in our fixture now. But here I'm just using business logic to test the code, and that's as it should be. So all I'm doing is I'm getting the live server.url, which is a, an attribute that gives me where the live server is running, and then I assert Instead of doing self.assert something, uh, there's an assertion there, hello world and browser title. Doesn't get a whole lot simpler than that. And so now we'll try and run this in the terminal. The invocation is also a whole lot simpler. Um, I do PyTest, but since uh, I haven't set up test discovery to include functional tests, I'll give it the path which is something that, again, is a lot more familiar to most people. And the test pass, right? A whole lot simpler to maintain, a whole lot simpler to deal with. So um, PyTest does allow us to have a neat way of separating business logic from other logic. Uh, these reusable features, which are called fixtures, are really handy so that you don't have to repeat as much code everywhere in your test suite. Um, it still has all the features, the live server test case with a lot less code, and it still does the same thing. And our CI still loves us because we want to keep our CI happy. As said on the slide, any questions? <laughs> questions? Yes. Hey, Peter. So with iteration one, Selenium went away. It actually didn't. Um, if you pull up the code for iteration one, you'll see that it's still there. Um, it's all here. Yeah, it's just in the setup. On iteration two, what, what ends up happening is that it doesn't show up on your tests anymore, but you do have that here uh, in your conf test where you keep your, your fixtures. 
right? Um, and this is just a clever way of, of giving us a browser and then at the end, because it's a, it's a generator, uh, PyTest remembers, hey, I have to go back there when the test is done running. So even if I get an exception, it'll still kill the browser instance. So you don't have a whole bunch of stuff hanging around. On CI, typically you don't care because when you run CI, you typically run it in a container and the container goes away after it's done. But you may be running this locally and do you want a whole bunch of Selenium threads that are dead in the background? Uh, no. They will, they will catch up to you someday. Any other questions? That's a great question. Thank you, Peter. Any other questions? Uh, yes. For, for like newer developers who are learning Django, on the, on the, like on the tutorial, they, they, they get the beginner test. Do you, do you advise that like the way to do it is to skip to that? Because that may be a kind of hidden like difficulty that's like above newer developers. So for, for those that may not have picked up on that, so for newer developers learning Django, is it recommended that we stick to what's in the tutorial and just write unit tests? My answer to that is no. You should write some kind of functional test. Um, when you're learning though, it's important to focus your learning. You may want to learn how to write the tests first or write them later once you figure out how Django works. Um, and you, you see that process a lot even in, you know, in day jobs where I may not understand how something works at first and I need to take some time to kind of dive deep into it before I go and write formal tests. Uh, you hear that called a spike. Um, that's again, incredibly common. But I do recommend that people learn that there is an interaction between functional and unit tests and, and that they test different things. It's a good question. Yeah. Question in the back. Why do you prefer Firefox? Why do I prefer Firefox? I prefer not to give more money to the Google than I have to. And that is a personal preference. Yes. Okay. So the question is, can I use Selenium with any browser? I believe Selenium supports Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, and Edge. I'm not 100% sure. I would check the documentation, but I believe it supports all those. Yeah, no, it does more. I, I think at the very dawn of time, uh, Firefox was the best supported. But uh, yeah, Jay. Oh no, I was I was agreeing with you. There could be a whole talk on setting up Selenium. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, there is a package called Web Driver Manager that's on PyPI that I use, and the reason I like it is because that way I don't have to think about it. All I have to do is set up a GitHub, GitHub token so that it downloads and installs all the stuff I need for me. Um, I prefer not to do, I, I, I'm smart lazy. I prefer to do the least amount of work needed to get my job done. Yes. If they would have, if, if it would, it's looking for hello world in the browser title, so the title of the browser, that's what the test was. If that, if that condition was not met, uh, I would have, the test would have failed. And it has the, the, the last one is the one with information in it, not the web test. Yeah, so PyTest would have, would have captured that test and shown me that test would have failed. In fact, we can show that real quick. Uh, it takes just a second. Let me misspell hello world and then run PyTest and you can see the result. <coughs> With my apologies to those at home that are watching this on tiny mobile screens. But you see that part in red there? Yeah, it blew up. But it blows up kindly in the way that helps you advance your life goals without throwing a random ass assertion error exception. To rephrase your question, does it scale? The answer is yes. There is something called Selenium Grid where you can run many Selenium instances and do many tests across many different things at once. Yep, a list of browsers, a list of operating system versions, 
uh, and many big companies do exactly that. You can actually automate entering um, things like in an input box. So you can do authentication. Um, basically anything that a user can do on a web page, short of throw a mouse against the wall, uh, you can automate with Selenium. Short of turning the box locks and the buffers. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 Selenium is, is famously bad at CAPTCHAs. Uh, I, I had a project that I worked on once where I needed to test that a CAPTCHA worked and all I can say is that I lost my hair and the effects were obvious. All right, thank you very much. I think that's all the time we have, so thank you so much. <laughs>
it, it, it's called the n plus one problem that I'm not gonna get deeply into what the n plus one problem is. It's just a, to put it simply, sometimes these, these, the queries that the ORM generates for you are actually very inefficient and you, you need to find what's going on and fix them yourself with things like uh, uh, prefetch and stuff like that. Um, so at my company, we use Sentry, which is a tool that uh, recently started actually flagging N plus one queries automatically. So this is an example of what, you know, what I could see, oh, this, um, this external API, th th this REST API endpoint is actually causing an N, N plus one query somewhere. Um, so you need to go fix it. So what Sentry tells us is uh, where it's happening in the code, and you can see it here, mm, more or less. No, here. This is, it's, it's in the view, it's in a render view that, and here's the path to the, to the Python code actually where this is happening. It shows you uh, the trigger that caused it. In this case, it's it's this uh, this URL basically. That's it's an, it's a REST API call. And what the, what the SQL query is that is off the offending uh, bit here. So it's uh, down here at the bottom. It's this this is the select that is getting repeated too many times. And it. There's a bunch of more inf more information that helps you debug things. But with this, with this information, um, we can go dive in and uh, and fix these problems. And sometimes it's very very that that's all you need basically. You can just you know go in and okay that's obvious. This this is the the query set that Django that I wrote that Django translates into an N plus one query. Sometimes it's a lot harder because there are things like decorators, there's caching, there are accessors, there, and all, all, all things that obfuscate where the query is actually happening. Um, so in, th in those cases, this is where this, this, uh, this extension comes in handy. So, uh, PG stat statements is a Postgres extension. So Postgres ex extensions are basically just like plugins. Think of them as, you know, plugins or add-ons for any kind of framework or application. Um, it is an official Postgres extension. So it comes installed, it, it comes bundled with the Postgres that you are running. It, it's already there, but it's not installed by default because it, uh, it it puts some load on your server. Uh, it's not a problem in my experience. In my on my local machine, you know, running post, you know, Django on, on my local Postgres, it doesn't really bother me. But obviously, I wouldn't want that on on production. Um, so this tip is about doing this on my local installation. I I have a lot more details in a blog post that I. Uh, published on GitHub. So basically how to get started is very is, is three steps. First, you add the PSS to the Postgres configuration. Postgres comes with a main configuration file called, called postgresql.conf. There is a line in there with the, the string shared preload li libraries and if this line is commented out, you need to uncomment it and add pgstat statements to it. And this is a change that requires that you restart Postgres. So you save the file and you restart Postgres. Number two, step number two is you need to, p you need to connect to Postgres as a user with a super user role. And uh, this varies, the, mm, there are, I'm, I'm sure you can Google how to find your, your super user for your local installation. Um, the bottom line is that once you log in, once you connect to Postgres, you get a, a, 
prompt with a hash mark, which is similar to if you're a root in your in your shell, you know, your local shell. So that has the same the same caveat as running root in your local shell. Don't do this. Don't make a habit of it. Uh, just do it this this once to install uh, TFS and get out, and then log back in with your normal root. Step number three is you want to activate it. So, well, this is where you need to be super user. So you uh, run this command, create extension pg set statement. It will respond with this message, create extension, and you're done. So now you can get out as super user. Okay, so what do we get with pg set statement? pg set statement gives us basically two things. A function pg set statement reset and a view pg set statement. Uh, the view uh, basically contains a bunch of columns that uh, our systems reliability engineering team uses. They use a bunch of these different columns to get very fine grained metrics of performance and, and uh, other stuff uh, that's happening. But uh, for our purposes, all we care about is the calls column and the query column. Um, the query, uh, the way that, uh, that pgset statement uh, understands or wha wha what it uses here in this query column is uh, what it calls a unique query. So if you have two queries like this, uh, so like th that only differ by some arguments, like here, like per lemon and like person. Uh, the unique query for these is basically the one where these two arguments are replaced by a placeholder. So, so you don't get to see what the what those arguments were in the query column, but that's okay. Okay, so. Now that we have installed it, activated it, let's use it. So, again, three simple steps to use it. And what I do is um, I set a breakpoint, a PDB breakpoint in my code next to the, qu the, the um, query set that, is that I suspect is probably uh, where the problem lies or right before. Then when I hit that breakpoint, I call this uh, reset view, a uh, reset function. Number two is do stuff, which in you know if you have if, if you're at a breakpoint, it it, it means that let uh, hit n to skip over to run the next statement. And then number three is uh, run the query on pg set statement and see whether because you in, in step one you reset it, in step three you will see very few w very few queries in the list, and and you want to you want to find out whether the query that uh, you know is the bad one shows up in your list. Um, and this is the game basically. Uh, the stuff that is in in step number two you can start with basically a very large chunk of code. You can you know try see uh, what happens w w uh, when you run a very long uh, set of steps and make this uh, the stuff smaller and smaller until you m uh, until you m uh, zero in on the the offending piece um, so as I said I, I like I, I, I like to put boundaries with uh, PDB breakpoints before and after or just before because if I hit n, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm stopping at the next statement anyway. Uh, I also like to use a GUI tool to run SQL queries like, uh, in I use dBeaver, it's, a, it's an open source tool, and that's where this picture came from. Uh, beca <coughs> because by using a GUI tool, I can keep my Django debugger session separate from the SQL output. Uh, which gives me nicely formatted tables. It's it's much easier to read than if I had if I ran you know queries in PC tables, which 
tables are horrible to, to read, especially if the lines are very long. Um, so, like I said, the, the, the game is to make the stuff smaller and smaller, so you can, you can use the binary split technique. So you have, you suspect that your, your, the problem is within these six steps. So, all right, so you, now you, you isolate the last, uh, the last three. Did the problem uh, occur? Then you know, okay, it's there. Otherwise, you would go to the first three. Now you, you uh, isolate the fourth and the fifth. Is the problem there? Yes. If no, you would go to six. Uh, then you isolate uh, step five. Is it there? Yes. Okay, and then you're done. Um, so stuff obviously can, can be recursive uh, in the sense that if, if your last, s the smallest step you, can, you could get into is a method call, foo, then stuff becomes, you know, bloop, it, it uh, blows up into the entire uh, definition of the method foo. So you descend into that and apply the, the binary split technique uh, all over again. Um, I don't have a demo because I didn't have time to set up a, a non-production example, so apologize for that. But in some cases, you might end up actually eliminating every single step, and then what do you do? Well, if you look, if you, look you might find that your method actually had a decorator, in which case, the decorator named something, the stuff that is method f, a method foo, actually becomes this, where this is the decorator, so you have some, some stuff that's happening before inside your decorator, then your, your foo call, and then some stuff after. And then basically you repeat the whole process on either the before or the after, uh, depending on you know, your hunches. There are some other tricky situations like caching, which is often is handled with decorators, attribute access, which uh, often is you know defined you know often often attributes are defined with uh, the property decorator. So again, now you have now you have your possible culprit, and um, serialization, cache key computation. It's that, that's that's one tricky case I ran into where the, uh, the, the n plus one was happening in the computation step that generated the serialization cache key, um, which is pretty much outside of any business logic that you might otherwise suspect. So uh, for this, it, it really helps to know your debugger and here are some of the most useful uh, debugger commands, like n, like I mentioned. Uh, step, if you wanna step into the next function call with a w, you can print out the current traceback so you can figure out where you're looking at. With a, you can print all of the arguments that were passed to the current plane. With u and v, you can move up and down the stack without actually uh, advancing the, the uh, program execution. And with C, you just continue to the next breakpoint or to the next one. And with that, uh, thank you. I hope this will useful, be useful to some of you. And uh, oops, this is not, this is the, my last slide. Uh, Fair Harbor uh, is hiring. Uh, I just looked at the page, at the, the job listings page. We're currently not hiring in the US, but the, our jobs page gets updated very often and it's, uh, there, are there are always new jobs uh, being posted, so keep checking. Thank you very much. Oh, sure.
Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so what, how do I compare this to this method to the Django debug toolbar? Uh, the Django de debug, debug toolbar is cool because it does uh, it does show uh, SQL queries that were run in the process of a request. However, the the limitations of the Django debug toolbar is that a you cannot use you cannot use the the Django to debug toolbar for REST API calls, for example or for management commands. Uh, we, we often have, well, separate topic, but yeah. So, so for anything that is not actually running in the browser, but it is like a, like a, a call that's, that's coming into the system uh, that you can only simulate with a curl command, you can't use the Django debug toolbar. There are uh, there are also other methods that you can use, like in uh, so like you can start your um, uh, you can you can you can start sh uh, with a management command. You can start shell plus with uh, dash dash print SQL, uh, and then if you know the queries that you want to run, like you, you, you want to basically make a uh, build a an object, uh, yeah, a model dot object dot filter dot something, and you know that this you're you're suspecting that this is the bad query. Uh, you can do you can do it that way, but um, but uh, the problem is that it's indiscriminate. So if in the process of doing this, uh, there are a lot of SQL queries being generated. They will all be be spewing out into your, you know, into your uh, uh, shell plus, and so it's going to be very hard to scroll back and find the one that you're looking for. Uh, also, it sometimes it's difficult to set up your objects just the way you need them in shell plus. So. There are all those other alternatives, but that's why I wanted to present this because I th this is like this is a way that you can pinpoint and isolate it exactly one query. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is, it is an inefficient query to put it simply. It's, y yeah. Um, the n plus one problem is, you know, there were a bunch of talks about this at DrangoCon. You can find all kinds of blog posts and you know videos about this. It's, it's, it's a, it can be a hairy problem. And I don't want to get into it right now, but yeah, it's an it's an inefficient query. I hope so. <laughs> speaker tonight is Jay Miller. He's going to talk to us about creating a multi-platform storage feature. Jay, I'm going to let you take it away. We had a couple people on the stream say that the mic was hot, so maybe let's move it here and see if that's better. Okay. This is the room mic. This is the room mic. I, I talk loud anyway, so <laughs> I'm sure that people will be happy and or sad. Um, do we have... Hey, 
right? Um, so I'm calling this day two edition mostly because I started working on this yesterday. So if there's a bug, we'll squash it later. Right? We're just gonna we're just gonna clap and say, hey, you did the thing and you did it in less than 48 hours, right? Um, so the a little bit of the history on this uh, for those that don't know or haven't interacted with me for any extended period of time, I'm Jay, I'm a developer advocate at Microsoft, and I have ADHD, uh, amongst a few other things. Um, I say all of that because October this past year, I wanted to do something for ADHD Awareness Month, which was to create an automated, an automated tweeting system that would send a tweet of encouragement for people who think they might have ADHD or were recently diagnosed. Um, and I did that by creating this wild system using Azure storage queues and hijacking Pillow and creating and doing this whole image manipulation thing. And I gave a talk about it at Pyjamas. And in that talk, I mentioned the idea of it would be cool if instead of the output being Pillow into Twitter, if it could be whatever I wanted. And this is kind of the starting of that. So uh, for those that don't know, what we're basically doing is creating what's called a personal ETL, or extract, transform, and load. Uh, these are pretty popular in the cloud space. You have things like send messaging services and event messages. And basically, you have some bit of data. That data gets stored somewhere. Then it gets sent somewhere to do something else. Um, you have these data ingestion services like Apache Kafka and Logstash and Grafana, and basically their whole job is to take a bunch of different data sources and put them into some place where other things can happen and they can be referenced from. This isn't that. Um, for good reason. Uh, it's cheaper, it's lighter, and it's more personal. That whole month of October, my total spend on cloud was six cents. It cost Microsoft more to bill me than it did for me to use the service. Also, I don't know who's using Grafana or Apache Kafka to send images to Twitter or Mastodon, if that's your thing. Um, if you are, um, I know a good therapist. I think, I think we, can, we can get you some help. Because um, that's like trying to hit a nail with a jackhammer. Um, it's just it's way too much for that. So we're going to dial these down a little bit, and we're going to use Azure Storage Queue. And you might be asking, what is a storage queue? Uh, we're in the U.S. If people are from Europe, they know what a queue is. It's a line. Basically, you get in line. Think of it as if, you're, if you go to McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, you had to wait in line until it was your turn to order. And then you placed your order and you sat down. And then if all of a sudden you go, you know what, I kind of want some chicken nuggets too. You don't, you don't get to cut the line. You go to the back of the line and then you go and you make another order and then you get your food and you sit down. So this is very similar to what a storage queue is but with data. You have data that comes in and it forms a line. And then some service says, I'll take the next thing in line. And then there's a decision that happens. You have to decide whether or not you're going to get in the back of the line afterwards and start the process over again, or you're going to be deleted and go away. In this case, they want to get in, back in, in the back of the line, so their DQ count changes to one. It increments by one, and then the next one gets served. Next in line. Once everybody in the line has been served, it starts over again. Say next in line. If that thing wants to get deleted afterwards, it can do that. So then it gets deleted. Now you have that until finally the line has been exhausted. So we talked about like basically what this queue is. It's basically a giant line service for holding data until it's ready to be called upon. But what does that data hold? And, and quite simple, it can hold bytes and strings. And here is a programming pro tip. If anything can hold a string, as long as the line count isn't limited, it can hold JSON because you can stringify JSON. And that means that you can basically pass it whatever payload you wish, uh, as long as you can embed it in, in some type of JSON. 
and that's what we're going to do. Basically, is we're going to manipulate data however we choose. We're going to convert it to JSON, put it in our storage queue, and then we're going to also have some commands that allow you to take that JSON and process it using a different case. And I know what you're thinking. How are you going to do that? What are you going to use? And there's a movie coming out uh, next year that really made me think of this. Um, and I call them Transformers uh, because they're robots in disguise. I'm kidding. I almost put robots.txt in disguise, and then I was like, that doesn't make sense. And I started getting sidetracked. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to take our input, we're going to transform it, we're going to put it in our storage queue, and then when it gets called on, we're going to transform it again, and then we're going to put it into our output. So I'm going to walk through a demo, but so I don't have to bounce back and forth between PowerPoint and VS Code, I'm going to let you know now, if you want to learn more about this, what I have currently in the last few days are the base package, it's called AZQ Manager. Um, it is on PyPI, you can pip install it, pip install AZQ Manager, all one word. Um, there be bugs and there be updates hourly, so um, pip install at your own risk. Uh, you're better off forking the code and just pip installing the local copy. Um, there's also a base template for if you want to build your own extensions and if you want, if you have time later, I can show you what those look like. I'll give you a hint, it's literally a .init file inside of a folder that has, it's an abstract base class because Jorge taught me about them like two weeks ago and then I was like, I need to come up with an excuse to use them. Um, so that's how, that's how we've developed this. Thank you, Jorge. Um, and then I have some extensions that I'm actually going to demo for you um, in just a second. Uh, we have one for RSS and we have one for JSON. Now, the JSON one is mostly so that I can have something to test with because then I'm just taking JSON and then converting it into JSON and then storing it and then taking the JSON out and converting it to JSON. I know that. Don't worry, there's some benefits to this that I can explain later. And if you are interested in helping, of course, as always, documentation, much, much needed. Um, testing, absolutely much needed. I'm glad we had a, a good test talk earlier. Uh, so now you should be empowered to go and write tests on my poorly untested code. And I do want to add the feature of supporting multiple transformers at once, which means instead of taking one data source in at a time, I can take a bunch of different data sources in at one time and call them in, which is kind of my goal. Mastodon is all over the place. People are doing activity pub and all this other stuff. It would be cool if my podcast, my YouTube channels, the content that I'm putting out for Microsoft and all that other stuff all got aggregated into one feed and I gave Mastodon that and I never had to go on another social media site ever again because that's probably what all of humanity needs. And then of course, if you're going to do that, you have to be selective about what gets loaded when, so kind of making that smart. And of course, more extensions. I talked about doing that Twitter thing. I need to rebuild that because that was its own Python package. Uh, called AZQ Tweeter that will be decommissioned and then will be replaced with this. And uh, with that said, I'm going to walk through a demo. So first I'm going to kind of talk about what is required, and you can't see anything. Um, let me change my settings because I'm not going to be at Team Dark Team. see that? Sweet. All right. Um, so we're going to walk through this first. These are kind of my imports. Um, I actually don't need OS anymore, uh, so that can go away. Uh, I was fixing this as we were going. Uh, the first things that you'll need are from AZQ Manager, you need a queue manager. This is going to be the thing that handles all the things coming in and all the things going out. You actually do need a queue or in this case, Azure calls it a queue client. Um, so I've kind of created a shortcut for that. So from azqmanager.queue, import queue client. And then you need your different extensions. So um, I call them transforms. So from azqmanager underscore JSON, import your JSON transform. azqmanager RSS, import your RSS transform. 
Next, we need an actual queue. Uh, I'm going to just create a queue here. In order to have a queue, you need an Azure account. If you need an Azure account, aka.ms slash Azure free. It's going to give you $200 worth of credits for your first month. So you can build that, build on stuff, and then delete your account a few days later. Um, if you get billed after that, I, I, I told you, I warned you. So I'm going to show you, starting out, I don't know if you can read that, but in tiny, tiny little letters over there, it does say SCPy. I'm going to just go ahead and delete that just to make sure that we got nothing here. There is no queue called SCPy now. We have successfully deleted that. So that's one of the things that I wanted to solve with this problem. Using Azure storage queues can be tricky because the queue has to exist before you add to it, and then some things will automatically add it, but most things don't. And then also, if you want to know how to delete things afterwards, that becomes a little bit of a challenge as well. So it's just easier if people who don't want to have to deal with that say, here's my queue name, spin the thing up, and when we're done, do whatever you want with it. So next, we need to define how our transform works. Um, every transform will be unique. so you would need to go into the documentation and see what the RSS transform needs. Basically, it needs an R, it needs a URL in, and it needs a time interval. So I'm going to give it a URL, and I didn't fill one in because I needed to shamelessly plug Python Community News. You might wonder how I knew about conferences and all those things. It's because I do a weekly podcast every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific where we talk about these kinds of things. It's all Python, no pip install required. But I'm going to copy my RSS link there so we know I'm not cheating here. So paste that in. And then I'm going to set the time interval for the last three months. And I specifically wanted to make it so that it was somewhat human readable because cron jobs are hard. Like, it's better if you can just put in three months, two days, one month, whatever, whatever, whatever. And what this is going to do is when this runs, it's going to pull all of the episodes that we've published in the last three months, which will be about like five or six because of Thanksgiving and we're recording another one tomorrow. Next, we're going to define how our JSON transformer works. There are a bunch of other things that you can define with this, like your JSON in file, JSON data, things like that. We're just using the JSON for output in this case, so there's no need to define any of that. Next, we define our client. So we say from our connection string, my connection string is magic because if I share it with you, I then have to go recycle keys. Um, so it's there. You just can't see it. Uh, and then we're going to apply that queue name, which was scpy. Lastly, we're going to define our manager, our queue manager. And we're going to give it all that information. We're going to say our queue is that queue client that we just made. Our input transformer is that RSS transformer. Our output transformer is that JSON transformer. And from there, we're going to run it. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to queue messages. So remember, right now, no queue exists. There is no queue called SCPy. And there is, it's not there. It's in stream two. I'm going to have to recycle that queue now. So wait. It happens. Luckily, it's all test accounts, so that's great. Um, so we know that there's no queue, and we know that we just gave it an RSS file, and we want to find the last three months. So again, I'm going to add that environment variable that y'all totally didn't see right there, and I'm going to tell it to run python.test.py. And it's going to warn me because it's like, hey, homie, you didn't supply a JSON data in or out file. I don't know what to do with that, but that's OK. That's just a warning. That's in case you were trying to bring data in. It needs something to pull from. So now if we go back to this queue here, it doesn't exist. I'm going to right click. I thought I was going to right click and hit refresh. Let's try that again. There we go. Hit refresh. Now there is an SCPy again. 
We realized that there wasn't a queue there, so it went ahead and created it for us. And it populated it with all of the podcast episodes from the RSS feed from the last three months. And it put it in that message set. So now I could do whatever I want with that data. And what I want to do with that data, we're going to comment that out. I just want to call it. Now, I could call one, I could call five, I could call as many as there are that exist. But what I'm going to do is just say load everything. And if you remember, the input transformer was RSS. That's how we knew where to go and pull that data from and how many to pull from. How, what was that, that filter that we used to keep it from downloading absolutely everything? So just like that, we have an output transformer, which is that JSON. The JSON out file takes that data and puts it in a JSON file for us. And I named that JSON file just test.json. So we run it again. It's going to warn me again. OK. And it's going to say, hey, you're done. And then let me get out of presentation mode. Open this up. We see a test.json file right there. Click on it. And there's now a JSON document with all of that RSS data. So the hope is eventually I can do something similar with an RSS file. And like I said, with the ability to aggregate a bunch of different inputs, I can then create my own custom RSS file that's built off of the backs of all of the other RSS files that I generate when I create content. So again, this is, this is day two of working on this. I'm really excited. I've got the blessing. We're going to be using this for some stuff at work, which I'm happy to talk about because it's all like open source stuff. Um, everything I work on is MIT licensed unless my bosses tell me I can't do it that way. Um, so this is MIT licensed. If you want to work on it, if you want to develop your own and you want to make it work for some other service, then I encourage you to do so. The more services like this we have, the better off our ecosystem. Oh, I keep touching the microphone. Sorry about that, people online. Um, <laughs> the better um, it is for the ecosystem and the more we can actually start using Python for things outside of work, like fun and stuff. So that's it. I'm happy to take questions. So there is, there's actually a couple of things that I'm testing that I, I couldn't get working before the, this. One of those is built-in support for Azure Functions, which allows you to use what's called a queue trigger. And at that point then, you don't have to do the, hey, load in, load out. You can just say, when something gets added to the queue, go ahead and process the outbound. Um, that's something, again, the code's written for it, but we just, we just announced Python 3.10 support and a whole new like system for it. So I'm still learning how that all works. So doing my job while doing fun stuff too. Uh, that said, adding Rich, adding probably Typer and adding some command line, you know, fun to it as well. Definitely on my list of things to do and, and would love help with that. Any other questions? Any other questions? They could, but they would be limited to whatever the API limits are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but again, I think if they're doing that, they're probably using something like Apache Kafka or some other service. Um, this is kind of designed to be hacky by, you know, by design so that companies like that probably don't do those things with it. Any other questions? It, it pulls whatever the RSS feed has. Um, so it's, I mean, it's in this case, it's an extension. So it's just using feed parser and saying, hey, parse whatever this feed is, and then iterate through the entries based on a certain value. 
which I believe the entries are based on the published data. So sort of based on published data. And actually the way that this works with the time intervals, it's, gra it's looking at everything and it's just running a filter. And it's saying filter by the published parse value and it's creating its own time date based on the interval that you gave it. So now minus whatever you gave it, you give me everything that's greater than that. But yeah, it's some if depending on how it's written, it could be slow. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is even replacing JSON with UJSON, because these are these are cheap. You know, text is really cheap. It's just it's bits, maybe bytes at that. But at at the end of the day, like if you have a massive payload or if you're trying to iterate through, you know. I believe Azure Storage Cube can hold like, I think it's like 500,000 records at a time. So like, yeah, if you try to iterate through that and it's kind of chunky, you're gonna have a, it's gonna have a problem. That pretty much wraps up our meetup. Uh, thank you for coming. I want to thank our, our speakers, Jorge, Jay, and Fulvio. And I want to thank um, Qualcomm, Microsoft, and JFrog for sponsoring the meetup. Uh, thanks for coming. And um, we'll see you on January 26th. Cool. Thanks. Oh, and we have to be out of here by 9. Unless you're a Qualcomm employee, then you can stay here later if you want to, I guess. We're technically still live. No, no, it's fine. The video's off, but yeah. So that's that's how I'm capturing everything through YouTube. But a couple people on YouTube were complaining about the audio, so that's why I was going to test the audio right now. Oh, just the. So I was going to go through some. Because I can't load up YouTube and listen to YouTube while I'm doing this because this thing is my audio input and then both my USB and both my input are up on my laptop. So I was just going to connect to YouTube and listen. Unfortunately, <laughs> mine in somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Oh, there's I'll put my mouse pad in. Thank you. Save me a million of they don't want. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they have stuff, but I don't know. So this is the microphone for the room. Right. So there has to be some way to like hook into yeah, it. Yeah, you're wrong. So I don't know. Whatever. I'm just gonna make a screen display for all the audio. Yeah, this messes with some stuff. Yeah. I I don't mess with it. General Thomas, and they had a room with, you know, you, you could reroute things yeah. to laptops or uh, Twitter, some sort. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, this is actually. Oh, this is so small. Yeah, I, I actually have those oh, yeah, cables yeah. if we need them. Oh, you see this right here? Yeah, I see it, but I don't really want to like unplug those. It yeah. doesn't look like it's going to be easy to unplug. No. Like, I don't want to mess with their stuff if. Possible, <laughs> like I mean, you know, things that I'm not supposed to mess with, right? Like, yeah. I don't think you can come aboard. <laughs> you would think that, and there's also just like reroute. So there's also this here. Oh yeah. So there are also like it's again, you know, like the I don't know, but that's all.
Yeah, I would need a second phone because my phone is the camera, yeah, right? True. <laughs> Don't forget, like yeah, a Wi-Fi only fold out has a second. Yeah, I could do that. Um, yeah, I'm just doing I have my Android that doesn't take data. <laughs> I'm gonna just walk away from you talking, but is this your phone or what? Oh, yeah, because this is where the speaker of it is. Oh no, um, he wants us to oh, just that, keep yeah. talking with this, but the YouTube feed. Right. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what he wants us to Just say, but we get presentation guess. voice or volume. Um, this should be about good, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, what kind of stuff do you do? <laughs> oh, uh, computer consulting. Um, uh, tech, tech, troubleshooting that kind of thing. Starting my own company. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been a member I of the um, Python, the mostly the weekend one, yeah, but it's all been on Zoom. This is the first in person. The, um, we've moved to Discord, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but for the, yeah, but I just mean like the virtual ones, and so it's nice to come into these. Yeah, I'm trying to get hired right now. Oh. I'm looking for work. Um, I do cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. Oh, cool. Um, coding, IT. Nice. I took a ton of free courses at, um, the community college. SCCE, the com continuing ed, mm -hmm. and, and all like CCNA, one through four, Cisco certified, the um, CYSA preparation course a few times. Oh, very good. I really yeah. like cybersecurity. It's just kind of fun. <laughs> I don't know, because um, I, d I guess you'd have to really like it because of all the zero day stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, because. Um, and have a feel for concepts really more than anything. Yeah, there's a few articles that I follow, and then this one guy has a YouTube for daily zero-day stuff. And um, sometimes I watch it, sometimes I don't. Yeah. You know. Could How was you that? Put the mic on. Oh, put onto the gun, like <laughs> right here, and I want to speak. I want to hear what. Um. That's what they're saying is what happens. Like the buzz noise. It's coming just I'm listening to it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> as if you were presenting. <laughs> oh, definitely. So what aspect of cybersecurity have you most been interested in? Um, I'm mostly interested in the blue in the um, blue team. Okay. So in cybersecurity, there's a blue team, a red team, and then if you can do both, there's purple team. Right. I do some purple team, you know, and that's kind of nice because when you do purple team, first you're the red team trying to get into the system and you find all the exploits right. and whatnot. And then from there, you know how to secure the walls and whatever. Okay. Then you go back to red team and try and get back in. It's just a continuous cycle. Um, what I've seen, there's the majority for red team is click the information. <laughs> yeah. Or um, a lot of getting it people to click on the web page that looks like an internal page. The, the easiest part is the social engineering. That's the, <laughs> the number but, one. But, um, you know, with online stuff nowadays, it's... Especially if you're working for a website. Or, or an evil twin standing up a, a Wi-Fi with a similar SSID. Or yeah, definitely. Spoofing. But, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, again, um, social engineering. Because, under that, yeah. yeah, whenever there's the human aspect, there's going to be an entry point or a potential entry point, really. But um, when you're dealing with a website, they're trying to make it so that it's foolproof. And... Basically, if they allow you to do it, it should be completely secure. And so, you know, they have the portals, they have the questionnaires. And then when you buy something, like if you think about it, when you buy something on Amazon, they have the one single, like, buy it now or bid. Right. And then it's all addresses and your credit card number. And then even that has, like, specific things that you can type into it. And it doesn't allow certain characters or strings that are too long. Yeah. yeah. You raise a good point because the cookie almost never expires. Once you're signed into Amazon, I mean, it's fairly prompt. Maybe every five months. Mm -hmm, I guess definitely. Now, there should be some kind of sweet dongle that they force you to see that you can have an Amazon. And then when you buy things, you know, touch it to our USB or some physical 
multi-factor thing <laughs> to make sure you're you. Yeah. Um, you can add a new card that could be a free yeah, credit yeah. card or loan card to your account and just say, yeah, okay, you're you. Yeah, definitely. And um, there are certain things that are that secure, but that's mostly only for... Okay. <laughs> it was definitely quiet when it wasn't on. Oh, yeah. But people kept it. Yeah, I don't know. Because they were basically saying it was too hot during Jorge's talk and then too quiet <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there was... It actually... I, it didn't look like it was clipping to me. For me, it was quiet, and then like there was a little bit of back noise, background noise. So I don't know. I'm gonna stop the stream and yeah, are you gonna fiddle with it.